Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. Sure is a cold start out there. Temperatures are in the uh, teens and 20s this morning. Hats and gloves will feel great. We are going to see much warmer temperatures this week, but also a good bit of rain. I'll show you all of it coming up. Four people are dead after this car crashed into the woods in, on I-95 near in Johnson County. Coming up, what we're learning from investigators. It's a terrible scene there on long I-95 North. We'll have all that coming up. Thanks for seeing with us in the 8 o'clock hour here in Fox 50. I'm Ken Smith. And I'm Jeff Hogan. Yeah, 8 o'clock hasn't done much for our temperatures. Mm -hmm. Still hanging low. And Elizabeth Gardner in the WRS Severe Weather Center. Right now, these teens, is, I mean, it is coldest start to the day we're going to have this week, right? It is, for sure. <laughs> Big changes in our weather pattern start really tomorrow. We're going to see more cloud cover, a better chance for showers, warmer temperatures. But we'll be cold and dry today. 14 in Roxboro, 17 South Hill, 19 in Goldsboro and Clinton, 19 in Southern Pine. So cold air for you this morning. This high pressure system has brought us the chilly air and the beautiful sunshine that we saw over the weekend. But we're about to change the pattern. More of a flow coming up from the south with warmth, but also with moisture. You can see some wintry mix back to our west. We don't have any wintry precipitation in our forecast, but we'll certainly move into a wetter pattern. Beautiful start here in southern pines. It is frosty out there on the greens. Got them all covered up so they're not damaged. 22 is our temperature. Our wind is out of the southwest now at 5 miles per hour. That will help our temperatures to start warming up today, but we'll only climb into the upper 40s this afternoon which is just below normal. I'll show you when our temperatures could be at least getting a little closer to record highs coming up in just a bit. Brett. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, we have some breaking news right now out on uh, the Durham Freeway, a crash near uh, Mangum Street. You can see a lot of our live look there from the DOT camera that is right there at Mangum Street and a number of cars that are involved in this crash. So we're going to learn some more information about that, but it is closed that inside lane and it's causing some pretty big backups on the Durham free Freeway as you get into the downtown Durham area. You can see a lot of red on our sensors. We're tracking about a 10 to 15 minute delay right now on the Durham Freeway. Let's take a wider look uh, around the rest of the triangle. There are a number of other crashes to tell you about, a number of other pockets of slowdowns that we normally see here in the 8 o'clock hour. First, we're going to zoom in on a uh, newer crash that is on Edwards Mill Road near Re Reedy Creek Road. Not seeing any delays on the sensors there. This is an earlier crash on the Beltline 440 near Lake Boone Trail. That should be in the clearing stages at this point. Over off of uh, Nightdale Boulevard near Smithfield Road in the Nightdale area. Not seeing any big delays on this crash, or, or a disabled vehicle rather, uh, but we are keeping an eye out on that one. Taking a look uh, south of Raleigh on I-40 as you're trying to get over to the US-1 and 440 interchange. A five minute delay, but give yourself plenty of extra time. We're really starting to see a lot of traffic build up. You can see some stop traffic there as you approach that interchange. <laughs> But thanks. Now to a story we've been following all morning long out of Johnston County. Four people are dead after a crash on I-95 North near the Brogdon Road exit, not far from Four Oaks. WRL's Kelsey Coffey is at that scene right now. And Kelsey, what have you been able to find out from state troopers? Ken, state troopers say that only one car was involved in this crash and that car is being taken away from the scene right now. You can just see how uh, the entire car is damaged. You can uh, really hardly see the front seat. It only seems like the back seat there uh, is what's intact. So that car hit some trees that are here at this off ramp. Uh, this off ramp is on I-95 North. This is at exit 93 on Brogdon Road. Now that ramp has since reopened. So this is not something that should impact your morning commute. We're still working to find out the names of the four people who were killed. We're also just asking police how a crash like this uh, could even happen in the first place. And we'll keep you updated as we find out more. Kelsey Coffey, WREL News, live in Johnston County. This morning, Durham school employees who have been striking could get a solution to issues with their pay. And that would be good news for the families who rely on those buses to get their children to and from school. WRL's Laura Levine explains what we could learn at the meeting. It's just getting started now. Parents and families are waking up with that uncertainty, not knowing if their bus drivers will show up to work to take their students to school today. This morning, DPS is advising parents to use their parent portal for real-time bus information. This call all comes as DPS says some employees received overpayments between July through December of last year due to an error in implementing salary changes for classified staff. This impacts bus drivers, instructional assistants, physical and occupational therapists, janitors, 
and more. Now, parents and staff have held sit-ins at DPS's office in response to the change, and parents have also been asked to provide their own transportation for children. And on Friday, the Jordan High School PTSA posted on Facebook asking for volunteers to clean the cafeteria and classrooms because there were no custodians who showed up. And it is important to mention that DPS did suspend their chief financial officer. We're going to learn more after this meeting today, which begins at 8 a.m. Laura Levine, WREL News in Durham. The field of Republican presidential candidates is only getting smaller after Governor Ron DeSantis suspended his campaign over the weekend. Doug Luzader explains this shakeup is forcing some eligible voters in New Hampshire to make last-minute decisions on who to vote for ahead of the nation's first primary. I am today suspending my campaign. And with that, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is out. It was a stunning fall for his 2024 presidential campaign, and he dropped out just ahead of Tuesday's New Hampshire GOP primary. If there was anything I could do to produce a favorable outcome, more campaign stops, more interviews, I would do it. That before endorsing his friend turned rival. Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. He ran a a really good campaign. He was very gracious and he endorsed me, so I appreciate it. That's the sound of a two-person race. Now the race is down to former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and her previous boss, former President Donald Trump. The people behind Nikki are pro-amnesty. You like that? Pro-China, pro-open borders, pro-war. I voted for Donald Trump twice, but rightly or wrongly. Chaos follows him. Trump still holds a wide lead over Haley in recent polls in New Hampshire, but so much of this may come down to what DeSantis supporters and independents here decide to do. It's very hard to predict New Hampshire uh, voters in a primary, and they can do things at the last minute and really shock uh, the political world. As Doug Luzader reporting, former President Donald Trump will be in a New York courtroom today as his E. Jean Carroll defamation damages trial continues. He'll return to New Hampshire for a rally tonight ahead of the primaries. Nikki Haley held a campaign event in New Hampshire Sunday, and New Hampshire's Secretary of State is predicting a record turnout tomorrow. Well, the man charged with killing the woman in Durham over the weekend is due in court today. 56-year-old Patrick Whitaker Jr. faces a first-degree murder charge and the death of 45-year-old Jennifer Moore. Authorities also charged him with larceny. Police made an arrest at a scene on Highway 55 around 2.30 Saturday afternoon. We're working to find out the connection between Moore and Whitaker. Also, we're still asking police how Moore died. As soon as we get an update, we'll let you know. The White House is vowing to do whatever it takes to protect U.S. forces in the Middle East after Iranian-backed militants hit an airbase in Iraq with ballistic missiles. That attack left an unknown number of service members with potential traumatic brain injuries. Meantime, in Gaza, a milestone has been reached as 25,000 people have been killed, according to the Hamas-controlled health ministry there. The majority are women and children. Well, today you can share what you think about a 42% proposed rate hike on homeowners insurance. The Department of Insurance says more than 8,600 people have emailed in comments about the hike request so far. That's more than eight times the amount of people who commented on the 2020 rate hike proposal. The public comment hearing is this morning starting at 1030. It will run until 430 this afternoon in the Albemarle Building on Salisbury Street in Raleigh. You can also join virtually at that same time. Today, Governor Roy Cooper will be in Charlotte making a plea to keep access to safe abortions legal. He'll speak today on the 51st anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision. Cooper will join other top Democratic lawmakers from across the state for a news conference today. Health care providers are also expected to speak during this event in Charlotte. It is part of a Joe Biden campaign initiative in the state, and it gets started at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Coming up on 10 minutes after 8, their beloved dog died in a Franklin County animal shelter, and now they want answers. Coming up, what the owners say they think happened to their beloved pet. Also, all eyes were not on Taylor Swift. That's the last night's Bills Chiefs game. Just ahead, how shirtless Jason Kelsey stole the show in support of his younger brother. Today is by far the coldest day of the week, 49 for the high temperature. We climb into the 50s Tuesday and then 60s and 70s to round out the week and head into the weekend. That might sound nice, but it will be wet. I'll show you how much rain we could see at the end of the week coming up.
Welcome back at 812. If you look live at Fenton in Cary, you see right there the skating rink. A lot of people still have an opportunity uh, to head out on that skating rink because it feels like it outside. Very wintry. Uh, don't be fooled by the sun, though. It's cold out there, as you're aptly going to describe for us. The meteorologist Liz Picard in the WS Weather Center. Yeah, we got that Arctic blast over the weekend, hanging around for one more day. And over the weekend, with all that cold air, we got to, to see the Fountain Mountain growing. The Fountain Mountain is a decades-old tradition here at WRAL. Uh, this is the, the second fountain that we've had since I've been working here. Um, and, uh, boy, it's just uh, it's kind of kind of a neat tradition to see that uh, mountain of ice there. That's going to be gone probably by the time we get to Wednesday or Thursday as we warm up significantly. Thank you to our weather watcher, Carrie Ann from Seven Springs, on her way window there. Lots of little frost. It almost looks like little snowflakes. Frost there as the sun's coming up. Love that photo. Um, go to WRL.com and search weather watchers. Drop your photos in. We would love to show them on TV. 19 in Southern Pines, 22 Goldsboro, 20 Rocky Mount, 17 South Hills, 16 up in Roxboro. Still very cold this morning, even though it's uh, 8, uh, 13 right now. Here's the big picture. This high pressure system slides away and allows more moisture to move up from the south along with some warmth. Uh, of course, it wintry mix back to our west. We're not going to see anything like that as our temperatures warm up, but we do start to see some of this warmth pushing in. Um, notice that uh, the brown area there, that's where the air mass is dry. We're going to see lots of uh, more tropical type moisture streaming in and sticking around. That Gulf moisture creeps in. We'll start to see it tomorrow. This is a look at Futurecast starting around 7. Around lunchtime, we're seeing some light patchy rain from the Triangle area eastward and southward. That uh, begins to taper off around the middle of the afternoon and we'll see more waves of it a very small chance of some showers on Wednesday, but that chance starts to go up late Thursday. Friday looks like it's going to be a fairly wet day for us. There's a look at Tuesday afternoon, just a little bit of light patchy rain, maybe a little light rain on Wednesday, but a lot of cloud cover that's going to stick around for a while. The rain starts to pick up Thursday late in the day in the afternoon, and then it stays wet for us into Friday and some showers again Saturday, Saturday night into Sunday. So all total for the next seven days, the mountains will get hit hardest. Three to five inches of rain are possible for our view area about an inch to an inch and a half. I wouldn't expect any flooding necessarily because that's going to be over seven days time. But keep checking back as we see uh, more runs of the computer models and see how things change as we get closer to the weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all featuring some at least somewhat good chances for rain and some warm temperatures with 60s and 70s. Brett. Thanks, Elizabeth. Let's take a look at traffic right now. We have breaking news out on the Durham Freeway. This is at Mangnum Street. You can see there's at least three cars involved in this crash right now and police have that inside lane blocked which is causing some pretty big backups right there uh, on the sensors we are tracking some pretty big delays right there it's a uh, between Mangum and uh, Duke Street uh, but right now our delay sensors is tracking 14 minute delay northbound I'd give yourself plenty of extra time if you're using northbound on the Durham Freeway a couple of minutes heading southbound as well taking a look at the rest of the triangle a wider look we do have a number of other crashes most of these are minor in nature and should be in the clearing stages at this point we'll zoom in on one of that's on Edwards Mill Road, uh, Road near Reedy Creek Road, and then that other crash icon there on the Beltline. Both of those should be in the clearing stages at this point. Over off Nipedale Boulevard, we are tracking that disabled vehicle near Smithfield Road. Not seeing any delays on the sensors. Just keep an eye out on that one. And then we are continuing to monitor about a four-minute delay if you use 40 southbound as you're heading over to the 440 in US-1 interchange. The death toll is climbing from back-to-back -back winter storms that have moved across the United States since last week. Authorities report 79 people have died in 13 states. Officials in Tennessee reported six additional deaths yesterday. That brings that state's total to 25 deaths since the storms began to hit that region on January 14th. Bitter cold temperatures are still gripping that area. Tennessee has opened warming centers across the state. Well, two Navy SEALs who disappeared at sea off the coast of Somalia earlier this month are now presumed dead. U.S. Central Command announcing Sunday the service members had not been found during a 10-day search and rescue operation. The SEALs disappeared January 11th while attempting to board a ship to search for Iranian weapons. One fell into the water and the second SEAL jumped in to help, which is part of Navy SEALs protocol. Construction is underway on North Carolina's first bus rapid transit line along New Bern Avenue in Raleigh, and some neighbors aren't happy about it. City broke ground on the New Bern, New Bern Avenue BRT line back in November. It will connect downtown Raleigh, Wake Med, and New Hope Road with a faster bus service and dedicated bus lanes. 
City leaders are considering a rezoning plan to allow for higher density development along that corridor. Opponents say it'll force existing historic African-American neighborhoods and businesses out. All you're doing is pushing black people off the bus, black people off their property, black people off their business. I think we have to make sure we get this right so that folks who are living here can benefit in the transit and then also to make sure that the transit is successful. There's a public hearing on the rezoning plan a week from Tuesday. Opponents of that plan say they will attend and speak out. A portion of Hope Mills Road in Fayetteville will be closed this morning for maintenance work. The road will be closed between Cumberland Road and Hayden Lane starting about a few minutes ago, actually. Crews hope to have that work wrapped up by about 1130 this morning. The Public Works Commission says crews will be repairing sewer manholes. We have a traffic advisory for people in Johnston County this week. Part of I-40 will experience temporary closures starting tonight. Bridge work will be required on I-40 West at US 70 to close for several hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. through Friday. A detour will be in place for drivers at exit 312. This work is part of a project to complete I-540. Today you can learn more about why bird populations are dropping in North Carolina and across the country. Dave Southwick of the Wake Audubon Society will give a presentation today in Oxford. He'll speak about what's contributing to the loss of birds in recent decades and what you can do to help reverse that trend program gets started at 7 o'clock tonight at the Granville County Expo Center. A Zebulon couple is looking for answers after their beloved dog Goober died at a Franklin County kennel. We first reported this on Friday when the sheriff's office arrested the operator of the kennel, Anne Marie Green. Jessica Jones and Brandon Look boarded their three dogs, including Goober, at Green Meadow Kennels when they left on a trip to Costa Rica in December. Jones says the person listed as their emergency contact, not the kennel itself, contacted them on Christmas Day to tell them Goober had died. My fear is that he was neglected, um, that there was something more going on than what was said. Now the couple called Franklin County Animal Control to get their two other dogs from the kennel. They're now sick with pneumonia, and the Department of Agriculture stepped in after learning the condition of that facility. Days later, Sheriff Kevin White announced the kennel is shut down, and Green was arrested. We've tried to reach out to Green by phone. So far, our efforts to contact her have not been successful. Several people are hurt after a house fire in South Bend, Indiana. Crews were called to the scene last night. It took around three hours to put out that huge fire, with part of the roof being burned out with at least 10-foot flames. Fire officials say adults and children were trapped inside that home for a time. Multiple injuries are reported. No word on the extent of those injuries, though. At least one person had to be airlifted to the hospital. CDC says a salmonella outbreak linked to tainted cantaloupe is now over. More than 400 people in 44 states got sick from that cantaloupe. That led to 158 hospitalizations and six deaths. Seven more people died in Canada. The tainted cantaloupes were sold at stores, including Trader Joe's, between September and December. The FDA says you, you should still check any cantaloupe you may have in your freezer. And if you aren't sure, just throw it out. You have a chance to donate blood today. The Apex Police Department is hosting a blood drive today from noon until 5 p.m. It's happening at the police department on Saunders Street. Well, Britain's Duchess of York, Sarah Ferguson, is battling an aggressive form of skin cancer. A spokesperson for the Duchess says doctors discovered melanoma after removing several moles while she was being treated for breast cancer. Melanoma is considered the most serious form of skin cancer. It can spread quickly to other parts of the body and potentially become deadly. There's a new all-time leader in college basketball coaching win. Stanford's Tara Vanderveer won her 1,203rd career game last night as her team beat Oregon State, and the win total now puts her right past Mike Krzyzewski at 12.02 over his illustrious, illustrious career. He had over 1,000, 1,129 of those wins at Duke. The golfer who won this week's PGA Tour event cannot cash in the $1.5 million first prize. Nick Dunlap is a 20-year-old sophomore from the University of Alabama. He won the event in California, but because he's an amateur, he is not eligible to take the prize money, just the trophy. <laughs> the golfer finished second 
is collecting the grand prize money instead. Dunlap is the first amateur golfer to win a PGA Tour event since Phil Mickelson in 1991. Remember that name? Yeah, he has some decisions to make because if he turns pro, you know what can happen. It's Masters, time. BGA, yeah. It's time. Well, Taylor Swift was at the playoff game between the Bills and Chiefs, but she didn't provide the viral moment from her luxury suite. Taylor Swift was at the playoff game between the Bills and Chiefs, but she didn't provide that viral moment. Travis Kelsey's brother Jason stole the show. You see him there, shirtless as ever. Yeah, he was the life of the party. At one point, he even climbed out of the suite to get down into the crowd. Keep in mind, it was like 20, 21 degrees there in Buffalo. Before the game, Jason showed up at a Bills tailgate party in the parking lot where he drank from a bowling ball. I don't know what the deal is with that Bills Mafia fans, oh but the bowling ball thing. It's a Bills thing. Yeah, yeah. Apparently. yeah. apparently. Yeah, apparently. It's pretty cool. Well, homeowners could see their insurance rates go up nearly 50% in a few months, and the Insurance Commission wants your thoughts. We'll tell you how you can share those thoughts coming up. As you get into your car, tune to WRAL News Plus on your radio in Raleigh on 99.3 FM, in Durham 96.5 FM, and everywhere on 101.5 HD3. Good morning at 826. I'm Ken Smith. You look out your window, you see the bright, sunny skies, but <laughs> let me tell you, it's cold out there, though. Let's get over to meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner at the WR Severe Weather Center tracking it all for us. It sure does look pretty, doesn't it? Um, soak in that sunshine, because once we get to tomorrow, the clouds roll in. They're going to be with us all the way into the weekend, maybe early next week. We're going to be settling into a warmer but wetter, cloudier period. Apex looking pretty this morning. Plenty of people out there, but bundled up. It's 19 in Lewisburg, 19 in Southern Pine. 19 in Tarboro, 21 in South Hill, Irwin and Goldsboro, 20 and Rocky Mount, 21 in Fayetteville. So uh, you may see some dogs all dressed up in their sweaters. I saw a few of those over the weekend. If you're uh, um, out with the dogs this morning, looking at those temperatures, of course, uh, in the 20s, we're going to climb into the upper 40s for this afternoon with lots of sunshine. Coming up, I'll show you how much rain we could see over the four day period into the weekend. Brett. Thanks, Elizabeth. We have some breaking news out in Orange County. A couple of crashes uh, on I-85 and then on I-40. We're going to continue to monitor those and give you a little bit of an update over on Fox 50. But I also do have uh, breaking news on the Durham Freeway as we take a wider look around the triangle. A number of crashes out there. Give yourself plenty of extra time. Durham Freeway also experiencing some delays due to an earlier crash, Ken. Brett, thanks. Well, this morning, Durham Public School leaders will be addressing overpayment issues for employees all across the district. Bus drivers have been on strike, which caused problems last week for families who rely on buses to get their children to and from school. The district is asking families to check their parent portal for updates. Next on Fox 50, four people are dead after a crash in Johnston County. What we're learning from that scene and the Today Show continues on WRL. Shot in 4K ultra high definition, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. It is still cold out there, 22 degrees as you're stepping out the door. We'll see our temperatures really starting to warm up this week, but rain to go along with it. I'll show you what to expect. Homeowners all across the state could soon pay more for insurance. The opportunities you have today to share your opinion about the nearly 50% increase. Parents with Durham Public Schools are expecting issues with buses after last week's shortage. How the school is addressing this issue with overpayment later today will be a, uh, mm. a uh, well-attended topic, yeah. certainly for discussion. We'll be all over that for you as well. Thanks for being with us. I'm Jeff Hogan. And I'm Ken Smith. Of course, we're all over this chilly start to our yeah. week and our morning. Well, boy, is it going to change later this week. Let's get over to meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner in the WR Severe Weather Center tracking it all for us. Our temperatures this morning still very cold. 19 in Southern Pines, 16 in Roxborough, 21 South Hill, 20 in Rocky Mount, 22 in Goldsboro. So it's a cold start. It's a sunny start, and that's going to change pretty quickly. We're going to see our flow shifting to southerly. It's going to push in some warmer air, but some wetter conditions as well. We're going to start to see that tomorrow. Right now, we'll take a live look at Southern Pines. Beautiful blue sky out there right now. Temperatures are chilly. Our wind is already starting to come out of the south, and that's going to help to push the clouds in and boost our temperatures, too. It'll be warmer than it was yesterday. Of course, we're starting very cold this morning, but we'll climb into the upper 40s. Yesterday's high was in the low 40s, so we begin the warm-up today, but we have a long way to go as we climb into the 
60s and 70s. I'll show you how much rain we'll see along with that warmth coming up. Brett? Thanks, Elizabeth. We do have some breaking news right now out in Orange County right, uh, on I-85 and I-40. Two different crashes. One is at uh, Churton Street heading on 85 northbound. It's uh, causing some pretty big backups. And then another one on I-40 eastbound uh, near New Hope Church Road. Uh, both of these causing some very big backups in the Orange County area. Give yourself plenty of extra time if you use that part of uh, the area to get into work or wherever you got to go this morning. Taking a wider look, we do have a number of other minor crashes to tell you about. Uh, a lot of these are in the clearing stages at this point, but it is uh, something to, to keep an eye out on. And then there's an earlier crash that uh, is on the Durham Freeway that we actually have a live look at NC 147 at Mangum Street. You can see the few uh, Durham police officers that have that inside lane still blocked right now. It's causing some pretty big backups. They are working to clear a couple of those cars. They did have a tow truck out there uh, just a few moments ago, so they're working to clear that one as quickly as possible. It's about a nine minute delay. I'd give yourself at least that much extra time if you're using the Durham Freeway. There's 85 at Churton Street. Forgot we did have that look uh, from earlier. That's what those backups are causing uh, from that crash on 85 uh, northbound. One of those minor crashes I wanted to quickly tell you about is on Edwards Mill Road. It's in the clearing stages right now as well. Hey, Brett, thanks. And that story you mentioned we've been following all morning out of Johnston County. Four people are dead after a crash on I-95 North near the Brogdon Road exit, not far from Four Oaks. Let's get to WRL's Kelsey Coffey. She's been on that scene all morning long to walk us through what she's been able to find out from police and state troopers. Kelsey. Ken, that scene cleared actually about 15 minutes ago, but I'll give everyone a look at where that car was that was involved in this crash. So a state trooper on scene says that uh, only one car was involved in the crash, and that car went over into the wooded areas that you see right there um, on your screen. And we've got video to show you now from earlier this morning when the scene was active. This is the off-ramp on I-95 North at exit 93 on Brogdon Road. That ramp has now reopened. So this shouldn't be something that would impact your morning commute. We're still looking to find out the names of the four people who were killed. And we're also asking police how something like this could have happened in the first place. We'll keep you posted as we find out more. Kelsey Coffey, WRL News, live in Johnston County. This morning, school leaders in Durham plan to address the pay issues that have workers staying off the job. It's caused headaches for families whose morning routines have been shaken by bus driver shortages. WIO's Laura Levine explains the school board will have a special meeting today to talk about all this. Parents and families are waking up with that uncertainty, not knowing if their bus drivers will show up to work to take their students to school today. This morning, DPS is advising parents to use their parent portal for real-time bus information. This call all comes as DPS says some employees received overpayments between July through December of last year due to an error in implementing salary changes for classified staff. This impacts bus drivers, instructional assistants, physical and occupational therapists, janitors, and more. Now, parents and staff have held sit-ins at DPS's office in response to the change, and parents have also been asked to provide their own transportation for children. And on Friday, the Jordan High School PTSA posted on Facebook asking for volunteers to clean the cafeteria and classrooms because there were no custodians who showed up. And it is important to mention that DPS did suspend their chief financial officer. We're going to learn more after this meeting today, which begins at 8 a.m. Laura Levine, WREL News in Durham. Well, today you can share what you think about a 42 percent proposed rate hike for homeowners insurance. The Department of Transportation says more than 8,600 people have emailed in comments about the hike request so far. That's more than eight times the amount of people who commented on the 2020 rate hike proposal. The public comment hearing starts around 10 o'clock this morning. It'll run till about 430 this afternoon in the Albemarle building on Salisbury Street in Raleigh. You can also join virtually during that time period. A man charged with killing a woman in Durham on Saturday is due in court today. 56-year-old Patrick Whitaker Jr. faces a first-degree murder charge and the death of 45-year-old Jennifer Moore. Authorities also charged him with larceny. Police made the arrest at a scene along NC-55 around 2.30 Saturday afternoon. We have no details on how Moore and Whitaker may have been connected. Also, police have not told us how Moore was killed. Today marks 51 years since Roe v. Wade protected the right, right to abortion across the country. That landmark ruling was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2022. 
Well, today, faith leaders all across North Carolina will speak in support of protecting access to legal abortions in our state. Representatives from diverse faiths will hold a news conference at around 10 o'clock this morning. They include leaders from the Universalist, Jewish, Baptist, and Methodist communities. Last year, North Carolina lawmakers passed a law banning most abortions after 12 weeks. Durham police are investigating what they're calling a suspicious death. They say officers responded to a cardiac arrest on Killarney Drive. This was just before 1.30 Sunday afternoon. The person was found unresponsive and taken to the hospital where that person died. Police said they are investigating this death as suspicious, but wouldn't elaborate any further as to why. We are working to learn more about a shooting in Johnston County that happened at the Junction nightclub near Benson. This was the scene when the WRL breaking news tracker got there about 2.30 Sunday morning. You can see several Johnston County Sheriff's deputies working this case. We've learned one person was taken to the hospital with serious injuries. So far, no information on a suspect. Today, former President Donald Trump will be back in a New York courtroom and his E. Jean Carroll defamation damages trial continues. After that, he will return to New Hampshire for a rally on the eve of the primary in that state. Well, hundreds of supporters packed a rally and uh, held Sunday by uh, the former president. Trump began his speech by praising Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. In a surprise move earlier Sunday, DeSantis suspended his campaign for the Republican nomination. Trump thanked DeSantis for giving him his support. I appreciate that, and I also look forward to working with Ron and everybody else to defeat Crooked Joe Biden. We will have to get him out. We have to get him out. We just heard. Well, Trump's long-remaining challenger, Nikki Haley, also held a campaign event in New Hampshire on Sunday. Recent polling averages put her 15 percentage points behind Trump in that state. We're working to learn if there has been an arrest in connection with a sexual assault report at an NC State sorority house. The university sent an alert to students shortly before 2 a.m. Saturday. A female student reported she was sexually assaulted by a male in, at the Pi Beta Phi sorority house. Police do not have the suspect in custody. However, they do say they have identified him and he is affiliated with the university. And happening right now in the WRU Live Center, following some breaking news, some of the new changes to North Carolina's election laws are likely unconstitutional. Uh, Republican state lawmakers passed them into law earlier uh, this past year, but a federal uh, judge ruled this weekend uh, they should be blocked into going into effect until they can all get on the same page about it. Uh, the main argument over it was about how, what should happen after people use uh, the same-day registration. Some lawmakers saying there wasn't enough efforts to reach people who had moved uh, to a different address. They say more effort should have been made uh, to contact those voters before canceling their ballots. Uh, GOP leaders can still appeal this ruling. Uh, the AFC Championship game matchup is set after a thrilling game between the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs. The teams traded the lead six times. The Bills took a 24-20 lead into the fourth quarter after this touchdown pass from Josh Allen to Khalil Shakir. But the Chiefs took the lead back early in the fourth on a touchdown run by Isaiah Pacheco. The Bills had a chance to tie the game late, but kicker Tyler Bass, his field goal went wide right. Words Bills fans don't like to hear. Well, the Chiefs hung on to win 27-24. to They'll play the Baltimore Ravens in the AFC Championship game next Sunday. In the NFC, the Detroit Lions are on their way to the conference championship game for the first time in 32 years. The Lions got off to a big win in front of their home crowd, taking down the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 31-23 to to move within one game of their first Super Bowl appearance ever. They will, they will go to San Francisco next Sunday to play the 49ers for the NFC championship game. Boy, they should be nice. Oh, yeah. And wide right with Buffalo. Oh, goodness. Again. That broke my heart to see that. Yeah, I know, right? Seafood lovers might not be able to enjoy a favorite entree. Coming up, why farmers in Louisiana say they're concerned that they could see the worst crawfish harvest season on record this year. Also, while we're on the subject, putting food on the table is costing more than ever, but some households are paying more. Coming up, which states pay the most and the least for their groceries? Eight forty-four is the time right now, and a picture of serenity there. Lake Gaston, just beautiful right there. Sunshine, 
calm waters. Chilly water though for certain and it is cold out there this morning, but we'll be on the rise here. It'll feel like spring this week when you see this jump behind Elizabeth right now. Yeah, look at that 22 right now. <laughs> We're going to jump to 72 on Thursday. The records for Thursday and Friday are in the upper 70s. We're going to keep it in the low 70s, but still um, what a change from the Arctic outbreak that we saw over the weekend to these much warmer temperatures coming up. We take a live look at Durham right now looking beautiful with all that sunshine. Enjoy it while it lasts because the clouds will roll in tomorrow and be with us well into the weekend or even early next week. The cloudy period coming, it'll be warm, but cloudy with some showers. 22 right now, dew point at 14. That just means it's nice and dry. Our temperatures will climb up above freezing around uh, 10 o'clock this morning, and then we'll climb into the uh, upper 40s for highs this afternoon. 18 still in Roxboro, but we're starting to see the temperatures climbing on up into the 20s now. Still 19 in Southern Pies, but looking at low to mid 20s for the Triangle uh, to Clinton to Goldsboro to Rocky Mount and Fayetteville. So we're getting there a little bit warmer out there. There's still 15 in Roanoke Rapids, again 18 in Roxborough, 23 now though in Lewisburg. It's 23 in Irwin, 19 in Southern Pines, 25 in Goldsboro. Around town this afternoon, nearly 50 in Raleigh, 48 in uh, Durham, and 52 in Fayetteville. We checked our cold weekend. We continue to hang on to some of this cold air that we saw over the weekend. That starts to slide out of here as our wind starts to shift to southerly. It's going to bring in some warmth from down south. And uh, again, temperatures climb well above normal. So we get into the dark reds, even the pink colors as our temperatures climb to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. 52 is our normal high, so 49 today, 55 Tuesday, and then of course 70s on Thursday and Friday, solidly 20 degrees above normal. And that may continue for quite some time. We look across the country and those red colors, uh, we have the potential for above normal temperatures from January 29th through February 4th, everywhere except for Florida. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? I mean, above normal for Florida may still be temperatures in the 80s. All right, we're looking at just a small chance for some showers for Tuesday and Wednesday. It picks up a bit late Thursday into Friday and again late Saturday into Sunday. Those right now look like our wettest periods of the next five days. Here's a look at tomorrow and you can see the clouds starting to push in pretty early. We'll begin to see some showers around lunchtime. We're probably not going to see much rain near the Virginia line, but it'll mainly be from the Triangle area southward and eastward along the I-95 corridor um, through the afternoon or so. And then it's quiet and then again, uh, some more rounds as we get to into the weekend. Looking at just a 20% chance on Wednesday, it uh, bumps up to a 60% chance on Thursday night into Friday, and then another round late Saturday into Sunday. Temperatures will be warm though, 60s and 70s. Elizabeth, thanks. Well, three people are dead and two others are wounded after shooting at an apartment complex in Central Florida. The shooting happened over the weekend. Investigators say it appears the attacker knew his victims. When officers arrived on that scene, they found a 79-year-old man, a 60-year-old woman, and a 31-year-old woman all dead. Two other people were hurt, including a teenager. Now, that teenager is set to be in critical condition. Police have arrested the suspected shooter, 26-year-old Tashawn Taylor, Investigators have not yet explained how Taylor knew the victims. More than 100 demonstrators showed up in Park City, Utah, during the Sundance Film Festival, calling for a free Palestine. Protesters say they were hoping to turn the media attention toward the situation in Gaza. The health ministry in the Gaza Strip says the Palestinian death toll from the war between Israel and Hamas has soared now above 25,000 people. The activists demanded a ceasefire. Well, with the 2024 elections now well underway, state officials are racing to educate voters on the new rules they'll find at the polls. Voters will now be required to show a photo ID, something most North Carolinians have never had to do. The rules for mailing in voting are changing as well as our other election laws. Politically, it's putting elections officials in a tough spot. Republicans passing new stricter laws. They say people don't trust in elections anymore and change is needed. Democrats say the new rules will disenfranchise legitimate voters, not stop fraud. The state's top elections director says she believes most people see elections as fair and trustworthy. Otherwise, they wouldn't be voting in record numbers like what happened in 2020. When you see voters participating, that's an indication to us that they still have confidence in the system. When you don't, it's my firm belief, you don't participate. And yet we're seeing voters participate, uh, you know, in, in on par with what we've seen before or greater. For more information on what state elections officials are doing to boost voter confidence and help the 2024 election run smoothly, go to the NC Capital section of WRL.com.
Over 600 nurses in Hawaii are prepared to be on the picket lines this week after contract negotiations broke down between the nurses union and the hospital. Nurses at a Honolulu Medical Center walked off the job yesterday and plan to stay on the picket lines for a week. The nurses union says the issue now is not over money, but about how many patients are assigned to one nurse. Hospital officials say the ratio requirements the union is seeking could affect their ability to operate and delay patient care. One nurse on the picket line noted her desire to perform well on the job, but said the conditions staff face present a safety issue. It's a safety issue when you don't have enough time to do a good job, and it makes us feel bad. We are here. We want to do a good job. I care. I have no children. My patients are my children and my grandchildren. If nothing happens this week, the union and the hospital are scheduled to go back to the negotiating table January 31st. Well, your favorite seafood restaurant may be scrambling to get a very popular shellfish menu item this season. Farmers in Louisiana are concerned they could see the worst crawfish harvest season on record this year. The shortage of the beloved seafood is due to drought and other inclement weather conditions. Now, to harvest crawfish, farmers grow a rice crop in two inches of water so the females can lay hundreds of eggs. But experts say that last year's drought stopped some farmers from flooding their fields. Harvesting season is typically between December and June. The cost of putting food on the table is skyrocketing across the country, but what you pay for groceries also depends on where you live. A household survey from the Census Bureau shows families spend an average of $270 a week on groceries. The exact amount fluctuates with the number of people in the home. Households in California, though, pay the most, $297 a week. The state where families pay the least... It is North Carolina, 266 per week. This week, a groundbreaking true crime series returns. TMZ brings a new special and Fox competition shows continue. Here's Ashley Dvorkin with What's On Now, new this week on Fox. 25 minutes, guys. A Hell's Kitchen finale and the return of America's Most Wanted. Here's what's hot on Fox. I'm John Walsh, host of America's Most Wanted. Monday, America's Most Wanted is back. Emmy winner John Walsh hosts the new season of the true crime series alongside his son, Callahan Walsh. The show once again turns to the audience of armchair detectives to help with leads as they analyze some of the nation's most gripping cases. TMZ investigates. That's followed by TMZ investigates, obsessed and and dangerous Hollywood stalker crisis. Tuesday, Celebrity Name That Tune features members of the Fox family. Next Level Chefs Richard Blaze and Naisha Arrington. Eugene, welcome. I'm here, baby. Then remaining players try to hold onto their turf on the floor. Hosted by Rob Lowe. I honestly think you've got two bad singers right here. Wednesday, it's more guessing good singers from bad on I Can See Your Voice, hosted by Ken Jeong. Ah! That's followed by three more singers revealing their famous relatives, while a studio audience deciphers clues on We Are Family with host Anthony Anderson. The winner at Hell's Kitchen is... Thursday, it's the two-hour season finale of Hell's Kitchen. The final three contestants face their last challenge and dinner service. Two are then tasked with designing a menu for their kitchen. One will be named the winner and the next head chef of Hell's Kitchen Las Vegas, along with a $250,000 grand prize. Listen to this place! Friday, Fox Sports brings in the action of WWE Friday Night Smackdown. That was Ashley Dvorkin reporting. Now, the winter edition of Triangle Restaurant Week starts today. It will include restaurants in Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Apex, Morrisville, Cary, and Holly Springs. Participating restaurants will offer a special two- or three-course meal at a set menu price between $20 and $50. Visit restaurant websites to view their hours and the days they plan to offer these special menus. We'll look at weather and traffic next.